admire John. Um, he is somebody who um, not only speaks with amazing authority and engages our students in the world of Native Americans, but he believes in the cause and he quietly but constantly works um, with them on their behalf. He works with the Shawnee tribe. He is uh, has advised the Native American History Museum in Washington, D.C., but what I think sets John apart is he's an expert witness when Native Americans go to trial to claim their treaty rights. Um, he is the author of five books, three for young people, two for scholars. His recent book is, which he'll speak about, is on removal. John will not ever blow his own horn, but let me tell you, he would be a great loss to all of us if he were not with us. My, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. John Pope. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that, that introduction, and, and thanks to all of you for, for welcoming me uh, here today. Uh, I believe that you might want to lift your mic up if you're a little higher. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can do that too. <laughs> ah, there we go. Okay. Um, by all means, uh, uh, raise your hand if, if at any point you can't uh, can't hear me or or things along those lines. Uh, uh, I'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then uh, any questions that, that people may have, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk about. Um, at its core, uh, what I'm interested in, in talking to you about today, and, uh, and, and obviously your questions can, can deal with that or, or go beyond that, uh, is the connection uh, between the past and the present, uh, specifically as it relates to the physical removal and displacement of uh, Native peoples uh, within uh, the past uh, two, 200, 250 years, especially, uh, and the ways in which that is directly connected uh, to the ways in which uh, Native peoples are portrayed and perceived uh, in uh, the American public eye in particular, uh, although it's certainly not limited to, to the United States. So uh, the image that I start off with here, this editorial cartoon from uh, from the early uh, 90s that you know hits on this notion of of what Native peoples are supposed to look like within that that American public uh, eye uh, and and the images that are so persistent uh, within uh, the, the the national public eye and the ways in which um, you know as, as I'll be talking about that it is um, incredibly dehumanizing um, and 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 Tears away uh, at, the, at the very kind of lived experience of contemporary Native peoples uh, and, and what that means for, you know, as we're seeing play out, uh, certainly in, in one way in North Dakota, um, what that means for the ways in which Native peoples are uh, and, and con their concerns are treated in the, in the present. So first, and, and I certainly won't go into to the longer uh, uh, legacy of this, but just in, in terms of the, the, the removal, you know, the history of removal and removal the way it's been viewed and is most often treated within American history textbooks, you know, the history of removal that most of us are familiar with, uh, are aware of, uh, is the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Right? Um, and, and this is in part what is portrayed on this, this map. Um, you know, looking from, from the south, from Georgia, uh, you have the various routes there taken not only by uh, Cherokee removal parties, but also Choctaw, Chickasaw, uh, Seminole, and Creek in the, in the 1830s uh, in particular. You know, what is largely viewed as the removal era, right? It's 1830 when Congress passes the Indian Removal Act. Uh, and that is usually seen as this trick with the Cherokees at the center stage. It is eight years later uh, that uh, the, the largest number of Cherokees, about 14,000 Cherokees, are forcibly removed at gunpoint from Georgia uh, to what is now uh, Oklahoma. 
Uh, now what you can see on this map as well, those purple, uh, uh, purple shaded areas all along kind of the western border of Missouri, Arkansas, and up into Iowa, um, is that this is where you have displaced Native peoples from more than just the southeast, right? That in fact, um, you know, what is now eastern Kansas by the 1840s, late 1840s, it is very much a patchwork quilt of Native peoples who have been removed from Ohio, from Indiana, from Illinois. Uh, and so you have, this is a lot of what I specifically have written about, uh, is the removal of tribes from the Great Lakes region. So uh, Potawatomi, Wyandots, Delaware, Shawnees, Ottawa's, um, uh, Ojibwe's, uh, and, and so on down the line, where you have you know, a similar experience, uh, but one that is less known, uh, less apparent, um, and is also part of a much larger history. One of the things that, that is uh, you know, a, a part of, of my latest book and, and, and what I'm you know, very much uh, focused on is the ways in which the, the whole removal era and the idea of a removal era uh, in a way frames and continues to frame that history uh, within a very specific uh, American perspective and American context. Uh, where Native people show up in the, uh, the national narrative of American history, uh, they show up in specific roles that we need them to play to tell our story, which is we have Native peoples at the first Thanksgiving. And after that first meal, those, you know, the Wampanoags are not discussed. Right? Um, you have, uh, you know, certainly for the Ohio River Valley in Kentucky, Shawnee show up when they're raiding Boonesboro. Right, and they have that obstacle to be overcome, and then they're not discussed. Unless you know, we get to come to the come to get you know, some, some comments. Right, the Cherokees are discussed to be removed, and then once they're removed, the way I always frame it and talk to my students about the Mississippi River is this river Styx. Right, the Cherokees are removed to the west of the Mississippi and never to be heard from again. Right, the, their history after that is gone because an American history shifts to the plains. Right, shifts to the Plains or shifts to the Lakotas, shifts to the Cheyenne, Arapaho. Right, so there's this, this way in which the history is discussed. Um, and part of what this map is, on the one hand, you look, it's a little crazy. Right? And there's a lot going on. Uh, and this is specifically uh, related to uh, Delaware, right? and Delaware removal. Uh, and part of what you know, uh, this story tells is the removal of Delaware from Indiana uh, in the early 1820s is, is simply one chapter in a larger chapter of removal, right? In short, that there is no specific removal era in American history because, in essence, all of American history is about Indian removal when it all comes down to it, right? Every stage of the way, removal is taking place. Right? And even after there is physical displacement of removal, it is the cultural removal. Right? And cultural removal is certainly intertwined with you know, the physical displacement, physical relocation. Right? All of that certainly comes into to play. Right? But in terms of you know, the physical aspects of it, if we take just the Delaware experience, right? at the time that Swedish, Dutch, English colonists arrive on the Atlantic shores, uh, the Lenni Lenape, the Delawares, are in what's now New Jersey. Right? And over the course of the next four centuries, right, Delawares, different communities of Delawares, move or are moved into eastern Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania, Ohio, some move up from Ohio. Uh, into uh, what's now Canada. Right? Uh, some moved into uh, southern Illinois, some moved down into Arkansas and Texas. Right? There is no single history of Delaware removal. There is no one singular moment of Delaware removal because it is part of all these larger histories. Right? And the ways in which you see by the 1860s Delaware communities in Wisconsin, 
Delaware communities in Canada, Delaware communities in Mexico, Delaware communities uh, in, in what's now Oklahoma, right? There is a diaspora right, of Delaware, and, they, and it's not such a unique experience because of similar you know, experience and similar uh, you know, events happen for other tribes as well, the Shawnees, the Potawatomi's, and others. So there is that, this period of physical displacement, physical dislocation. Uh, but what I, what I also really want to uh, focus on, I have a variety of, of images that, uh, uh, that, that touch on this, is what that physical removal has meant. Uh, one of the things that you see uh, and hear often uh, at various, especially at, uh, well, I mean, public events, but also at a lot of academic conferences and things, I think, especially for folks dealing with native uh, issues and native studies, is that before anything else, uh, they say, you know, first, I want to, uh, you know, thank, uh, the, you know, and, and depending on where you are, um, you know, the, 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 the raising the, the knowledge of the issue of the native peoples who had lived on that land prior to colonization, prior to occupation. Right? So, you know, I want to acknowledge that we're, you know, on the land of. And it's interesting, because in Kentucky, that's a complicated thing. Uh, in one part, because Kentuckians, uh, and, and the, the kind of Kentucky history is very much about Kentucky being this kind of open, unoccupied space that has kind of made uh, Daniel Boone and frontier Kentucky history about essentially being this wild, open land, um, and, and Native peoples are kind of the raiders, uh, these, these outsiders seeking to protect Protect what was this open space and hunting territory? Right. Um, but you would you would see you know for instance with Kentucky an acknowledgement of Shawnees, Chickasaws, Cherokees, right? Those who had lived on this this territory uh, before. Now, if you were to look at kind of where Native peoples live now in in relation to land that had been occupied before. Um, there's an interesting and, and many respects not surprising uh, map here. This this uh, came out, gosh, now I want to say it's probably four uh, four years ago uh, when 538.com expanded beyond just dealing with uh, polling and election results and moved on to a variety of things. This is one of the, the data compilations. Is so here's where from census records from the you know, 2000. Uh, and census records where native peoples are living. Right again, not in terms of uh, where we would would envision that happening, not surprising. And this is the connection that I want to explore. Right? I want to talk about. Right? Where where are high school mascots? And this is just high school mascots, right? This isn't just uh, you know, elementary school, middle school, but high school mascots. Where are those that reference them? Now, Oklahoma. Right, in South Dakota, there's there's a whole other discussion that we can we can have about kind of what that that means in relation to where Native peoples live and the, and the presence of mascots. So Georgia, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa. Right, five out of the top seven right, are are kind of hot spots of of Indian removal in the 19th century. Um, you know, and, and again, there is no single explanation. There is no single cause for that. But there is a lot that we can talk about in relation to what that physical displacement has led to in terms of the ways in which the peoples who now live in those states, who now live in those areas, view native peoples, right, and view uh, their their image, their idea, who they are, what they are, what they stand for, right? And and honestly, mascots is kind of the, the, the low-hanging fruit, as it were, right? Those are the easy pickings for this. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in, in various, uh, some fruitful, some less than fruitful, Facebook discussions with uh, fans of, of a team from Cleveland who thankfully, for a variety of reasons, uh, lost, right? But this, <laughs> right? But this whole, this whole notion, right? Right? This, 
this image of, of would you, for all those who, as, as the camera would pan the crowd, right, it showed so many people wearing their Cleveland Indians gear and wearing it proudly or showing up, you know, uh, at the stadium in red face and all these things. Could anyone even imagine walking down the street with a hat having any one of these other images on? Why could you imagine? And, it, and it's one of those things where I have a lot of uh, people when we get involved in these discussions saying, you know, well, what? So I'm Irish. Fighting Irish don't bother me. You know, what's doesn't matter. You know. And my question is not, you know, we're not talking about. Are, are those going to get rid of But why is, why are native people, like why is that where the line is drawn? Why, why would none of those be okay and yet that one on the upper left hand corner is? What is it about that? Right? What, is that what does that say? Right? And there's one thing for the notion of people saying, well, either, number one, it's just a cartoon, or number two, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's honoring them, this is honoring specific you know, uh, Bowie South Alexis, who was a Oscott Indian who actually played for the Cleveland professional baseball team in the early 1900s. Um, and I can say as someone who uh, is, is friends with uh, uh, this one Penobscot Indian who in no way feels uh, honored by that. Um, it's, you know, that, that argument I think is, is easily uh, dismissed. But uh, the notion that it, it doesn't mean anything, right? It's just a silly uh, massive, it's a silly image and everyone recognizes it as such, right? One of the issues is, is not the whole notion of, of who is honored uh, or, or what that entails, but what a mascot like that opens the door to, right? What that, what kind of conversations or what kind of actions that image allows and what it brings out, right? So for instance, I am a, uh, uh, a college football fan. I enjoy, and I enjoyed it even more before I had young children who wouldn't let me <laughs> do this. Uh, but college game day, right? College game day, big celebration. College football, talk about the games of the day. So two years ago, uh, there was a big game. Florida State was playing in Oklahoma at Oklahoma State. It was a big game. And this is what Oklahoma State students oh, no. did, right? Right? This is what Oklahoma State students do. Now, Florida State, right? Florida State is a university who is still, they're still allowed uh, to, by the NCAA, to play in uh, playoff, to participate in postseason play because they have a specific agreement with the Seminole Nation of Florida. Right? The Seminole Tribe of Florida has worked with Florida State and said, yes, we, we are okay with you using the Seminoles as your mascot. Um, now again, an interesting part of that is the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma thoroughly disagrees with that. Uh, <laughs> and, and one would have to imagine that the Seminole Tribe of Florida is in some with so many Florida State alums within their state. But that again, it's another discussion we talk about another time. Um, but what that use of Chief Osceola, right, and the Seminole as a mascot, opens the door to. The, the kind of discussion that that, that that creates or permits right, is just as troubling as any notion of, of the ways in which it's seen as honoring. And it's not, again, this is not an isolated incident. Right? I, am, I, am, I, I picked two different ones. Um, and it's easy to find several more. Right? There's a, I think it's Andrew Jackson High School in Tennessee. Their football field, their, their home field is known as the reservation. Um, and there are ways in which that comes out. But just this past, right, over a little over a week ago, right, at a, at a home game for the Hillsboro Indians in Southern Ohio, right, the other team brought the same kind of sign. And so, again, you know, mascots are kind of this low hanging fruit in terms of what that means of, of creating this image of. Um, of caricature, right, of, of eliminating kind of humanity and, and also the, the, what it does for 
placing Indians as people of the past, people, not people of the present, right? I mean, that's one of the big things, too. What does an Indian look like? Well, an Indian has a feather, right? An Indian is red, red faced, um, and all Indians march on the trail of tears. I mean, that, that there's this one, you know, there's particular ideas, notions, histories, all these things that, 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 that come out of this. And where does it all come from? And, and part of the thing about mascots is they, they become this face, but they, they also don't get at the ways in which the use of native imagery and ideas and all these things is so pervasive in our society. Uh, if you've ever owned a Jeep Cherokee, if you've ever had a Pontiac, uh, anything along those lines. And again, if you look at the history of advertising in the United States, Indians have always played a very prominent role in advertising. Um, you know, this is for Boston baked beans. Uncle Sam conciliates and Sitting Bull affiliates with Boston baked beans. Now again, I'm, I'm not completely sure what exactly this is trying to, <laughs> how Sitting Bull being force fed baked beans, Boston baked beans would make you want to buy them. Nevertheless, you know, here, you know, here's, here it is. There's a couple other ones that, that I just want to throw out there. This was fascinating. This was a recent uh, find. And again, it's not hard to find this stuff, right? This, this in no way, uh, you know, I didn't go to school uh, uh, to gain the skills to find this. All I had to do was Google American Indians advertising mm -hmm. images, and it is stunning, right? So, Virginia Slims remembers one of many societies where the women stood head and shoulders above the men, right? And this is uh, Princess Washing Scrub is at the top, right? Uh, little running water feathered uh, keeper of the teepee. I mean, it goes on uh, down the line. But it, and, it, and it, again, I mean, one of the things that's also, um, and this doesn't do it as much as uh, other advertising, you know, uh, whether it's Land of Lake Butter, which is still in it's, it's It's not simply the use of this imagery, but Native women are largely um, uh, objectified, sexualized, right? That there's a certain way, you know, the Pocahontas of Disney, mm -hmm. you know, it's this, this is the Indian maiden. We just went through Halloween, where no doubt there were a variety of sexy Indian maidens <coughs> Tracing around college campuses right and left, right? Um, and there's other ways. There are other ways. Um, and I'll just do a couple and then we'll we'll cut it short. You know, Apache deer, wild enough to shoot at. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean and this is I mean this is this is not satire, right? This is not Saturday Night Live. This is this is this is for real. And one of the worst. One of the worst. And this this happened in the early nineties and thankfully uh, through lawsuits came to an end. But Crazy Horse Malt Liquor, <coughs> right? Crazy Horse Malt Liquor. Now, Crazy Horse, uh, you know, Lakota, you know, Lava, Lakota warrior who um, uh, was killed uh, in, in 1877. We don't have images of Crazy Horse, who's a prominent leader. We don't necessarily know a tremendous amount about him, but what we do know <coughs> is he was adamantly, adamantly anti alcohol. Right? But this plays, you know, use, use of this prominent name, you know, uh, uh, use of this, this notion. And one of my favorites, a description on this. Uh, the Montana Hills, steeped in the history of the American West, home of proud and new nations, a land where imagination conjures up images of blue clad pony soldiers and magnificent Native American warriors, a land still rutted with wagon tracks of intrepid pioneers, a land of character and tradition a land that truly speaks of the spirit that is America, right? And this is what it is, crazy horse malt liquor. And that's what was written on the back of these bottles, right? And that's, that's the, the idea. And, and, and the pervasiveness of all this, all of this imagery from the late 1800s right to the present is part of why people have so much difficulty grasping all that is really going on in North Dakota. Right? And the ways in which this is tied up into this tremendously long history, not just of the physical displacement and physical removal, but 
the cultural aspects of it that that make my uh, a Standing Rock Sioux tribe member at that, I'm not sure if this is the, the actual member or not, there are so many people who are at the camp out there in North Dakota, right? But jeans and a sweatshirt, as opposed to, you know, you know imagery they might have, right? But they're still facing those, the, the same forces in many ways, right, that they've been facing all along. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, and there's, you know, obviously a lot of different directions, questions or, or thoughts may go, but, but I mean, I think that the main thing that I want to, 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 to emphasize is the ways in which removal um, is, is certainly not limited to, to one particular period of time, right? And that, and that the, the historical physical displacement uh, is very much directly connected to the ways in which culturally uh, Native peoples have been displaced uh, in the ways in which the image of, of Native peoples is used and, and perceived in, in the present.